For this assignment, our class went to the Milwaukee Public Museum. There, a professor asked us to make two pairings out of culture, posture, movement, and environment. I decided to do mine on culture and posture and movement and environment. For both my pairings, I did some additional research and have attached their citations at the end of this video. Let's get started. Posture is all about the different attitudes and ways one can hold their body. Every posture can provide some form of nonverbal communication, and every culture has differences in their communication style. By pairing these two topics together, we can gain a glimpse of understanding how the different cultures we viewed communicate. I did some extra research to look at how some different categories of posture, like open versus closed posture, will help support my ideas. Open posture is when the body appears to be exposed, which can reflect a sense of friendliness and, as you can guess, openness. However, this posture could also be used oppositely to make someone appear larger or more threatening, as they are taking up more space than a person with closed posture. A good example of open posture would be in this picture in the African exhibit where the men are hunting a lion. The men are positioned with their arms and legs spread out in a way to intimidate and appear larger than they actually are to the lion. What can be referred to as close posture involves keeping the body small with the extremities closed in around the body. This could reflect unwillingness or a sense of reserve. We can see this in this picture of the two Japanese women as they are sitting under what is called a siza, a common posture used in martial arts of Aikido that can be translated into proper or correct sitting. For this sitting, the women are mainly straight-backed, bending at the hips with knees bent and legs tucked underneath them to sit upon. I did some more research and found that this posture usually only occurs in Aikido or formal ceremonies like a tea ceremony. This posture could also cause a decrease in circulation followed by the pins and needles feeling in the legs for those who do not practice this posture often. It also may increase pain in those with already occurring knee pain. Another aspect of sitting seen in many of the different cultural exhibits was that there was few chairs to sit upon and so many people sat on the ground without proper lumbar support. This could have caused many people to experience low but lower back pain like this man here. Posture can also be determined by a person's occupation. For many cultures all over the world, women were keepers of the household and the children, so they spent a lot of time being bent over to complete their daily roles, like this woman here. I suspect there was also a lot of overuse injuries of their backs, shoulders, and necks, with all this activity revolving around being hunched over every day. A second example for how women's occupations can determine their posture would be these two women in this background of this exhibit carrying wood and water on their shoulders and heads. This could have caused more pain in their shoulders and neck regions due to overuse. Our work created by cultures can show us whether or not they placed a central focus on posture. For example, the works of art shown in this picture were from the Asian cultural exhibit, and you can see that each of these cultures have an extremely straight back with their heads up, regardless of what their extremities are portrayed as doing. Some of the standing sculptures appear to have a perpendicular posture or a rigid military stance. Related to my own American culture, I feel that we collectively have a much more open posture as we are an individualistic and independent culture. Compared to collectivist cultures, we are much more friendly and open. I know that I am a very open person and I communicate as such. For example, the formal sitting on the ground for the Japanese culture was the siza. While for American culture, the closest thing I think we have to a formal sitting posture is sitting cross-legged. Even in this sense, we have a more open posture. Our laps take up much more space and are more open than if we kneeled in siza. Movement and environment. For the next pairing, I wanted to look at how a person or community's environment would affect their movement in that setting. I believe that people in all different environments ergonomically move to increase their stability. In colder environments like around the Arctic Circle, humans living there most likely walk with smaller steps which consist of wider stride widths and shorter stride lengths. This would result in decreased gait speed and cadence. People may also appear to walk slightly hunched over to the observe the ground. By doing this, they could increase their stability when walking on the ice and slippery surface. In ways, it is similar to an elderly person when they are crossing the slippery surface to prevent injury themselves. 
In jungle environments, I believe that the people who live there would need to focus on where they are walking with all the tree roots and plants along the floors, preventing them from taking a straight path. Because of this, it would make sense that the people would have decreased cadences and gait speeds than if they lived on a wide open plain space shown here for some of the members of an African society. Compared to my own environment, I feel like I can relate more to the people that live in the Arctic Circle with our experiences of winter than those that live in the jungle. A lot of us living in the Midwest can relate to how we change our gait to adapt to walking on a slippery surface. And most of us can relate to how sometimes those changes we make don't really work and we end up falling. The purpose of this assignment was for us to understand how things other than mechanics can shape movement and how this affects our future patients. Our future clients will each be unique people with different influences on their body mechanics and this was a creative idea on how to get us as students to understand that in a new way. We need to understand this before we can learn how to treat them respectively and effectively. So for example, if I see someone with an abnormal posture or gait, I will need to look into their culture, environment, background, and personal history to determine if there are any other factors affecting that gait or posture. So that's the end. Thank you for watching my video. Bye.